Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1985 release Phenomena by Dario Argento. Uh, and it's a giallo, but it's also a bunch of extra <laughs> mixed in, to be honest. And um, it's not it's not my favorite Argento film. It might Actually, at the moment, it might be my least favorite Argento film. I haven't seen all of his, but of what I've seen, I've seen a bunch. And um, it might be my least favorite, to be honest. And I think at, at the moment, my most favorite might be Deep Red. I know a lot of people out there hearing that and being like, but Suspiria, Suspiria is great, and it's definitely up there, but it might be, by a bit, Deep Red. But anyway, uh, just going to let people know uh, up front, if you don't know this about it, uh, th this is an older film, so I will be going into spoilers on this, so if you have not seen the film yet, stop right here, go watch it, then come back and watch the rest of the review, because I would say that it's definitely worth seeing once. I know I said it's not my favorite, but it's definitely interesting, and I'm glad I saw it. I probably won't rewatch it, but it's definitely worth seeing once, especially if you're into Argento, because, you know, you can see Argento in the film, not physically, but his influence, his directing, all, his writing, all of that. So, anyway, as we move on here, written and directed by Dario Argento, but also written by Franco Farini, who also was involved with Demons, Demons 2, Opera, and a few other Argento films. So, you know, consistent collaborator with Argento. This film actually came after Tenebre, which I really liked. That's up there for me as well, as far as Argento films go, and before Opera. I was good with Opera, but that falls further down the list for me. Uh, Jennifer Connelly is in this, and this was very early in her career. Obviously, she's quite young in the film. Uh, this was after Once Upon a Time in America that she was in and before the movies Seven Minutes in Heaven and Labyrinth. The big one, the big one that I think, <clears throat> excuse me, the big one that I think set her career off, Labyrinth, which I own. It's back in my DVD collection slash Blu-ray Blu -ray collection back here somewhere. Love that movie. Uh, Donald Pleasance is also in this one. I love Donald Pleasance, the way he acts I love his acting style, and uh, he was very good in this one. His Scottish accent kind of like came and went throughout the film, so that was a little bit iffy, but um, I just like his acting. He's It's always good to see him in a film, and he did a good job in this, I thought, for the most part. Uh, I wrote down just an interesting fact about him. He has 236 IMDb credits at the moment, which is a lot, a lot, a lot. That man did work. Uh, New Line Cinema had bought this particular movie for distribution in the United States. They cut 20 minutes out of the film. That's a lot. And then released it as Creepers. So, now I would be interested to see, I believe the, the version I saw, it was on Shudder when I'm reviewing this, and, the, and that's where I watch it. So I assume that's the, the uncut version. Uh, I wonder what it would be like with 20 minutes cut, because to be honest, it felt a little bit long to me. There were a lot of shots, a lot of scenes that kind of just like went way too long. So I wonder if they cut some of that stuff or if it was a situation where they were cutting for more of an R rating. So they just cut like some of the gore things. I don't know. So I would be interested to see both cuts and make that comparison. The soundtrack for this is comprised of uh, pieces of music by The Goblin, as it says in the intro. Not Goblin, but The Goblin. Uh, Iron Maiden and Motorhead. Um... So when it's Goblin stuff, like you're just at this point, I'm just used to like Goblin's music in our Dario Argento films. And it, it's heavy handed, like Argento uses music in a very, very heavy handed way. And sometimes it's just like fun, like the Goblin stuff is just fun because it's it's fun, interesting, unique music. And so when he throws it in, you're just like, oh, it's Goblin. OK, here we go. And, it, and it's a good time. Um, but it's particularly in this film when he's using the metal of the 80s, like the Iron Maiden stuff and Motorhead. I, like, I, I even wrote down, <laughs> wrote down, I love Dario's, uh, his uh, enthusiasm for 80s metal, but his, it's misused in this. Like, when he puts it in, with the scenes that it is, it feels like it's very, very mismatched. It just does not work, and it takes you out of it, and you're just like, why, why are we doing this right now? It really very much feels like he was just like, I like this type of music, I like these songs, I'm going to shoehorn them in here, whether they make sense or not, and they don't make sense. It doesn't sound good. Um, this was actually one of Argento's favorite 
films that he ever made, and he wanted to actually make a sequel to it in 2001, but he was held up from doing that because of contract issues with Medusa Films, and so they kept that from happening. I'm going to be honest, I am fine with the fact that there was never a sequel to this because um, it's not my favorite. Like, I don't think it deserves a sequel. Like, it's not good enough to warrant a sequel. And I think a lot of people probably would not have seen the sequel, except for all your, you know, diehard Argento fans. Although, to be honest, now that I kind of think of it, if it had been made, I would probably feel like, well, it's Argento. I kind of have to see it just because. But I just... Based off Phenomena, I don't think it would be that great. It's weird. And where I'm coming from on that, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, is I feel like Phenomena was basically two movies. It was two movie ideas that he was trying to do at the same time, and he's just like, I'll just mash them together. And they don't really work together, in my opinion. They really don't work together. Um, all right, so let's talk about the actual movie portion of things amazing scenery in the very beginning of this like it, the way it's set up it's beautiful it's in switzerland it looks amazing the scenery is unbelievable and that's something that argento usually does extremely well like pretty much all of his films he has really interesting sets um really interesting locations that he finds whether it's inside or outside um one of one of my favorite things about argento in in general is that when he shoots inside of buildings he gets very interesting looking buildings and he also has a tendency to have a lot of, like, hidden areas in the film. And you see that early on in the film, too, when there's, like, a chase scene through, a, uh, like, these caves at a waterfall. And the waterfall looks beautiful. And the caves look beautiful and interesting. But he always has, like, these kind of, like, in addition to just cool locations and interesting locations, just hidden areas will be, like, you know, a secret passageway or at, towards the end of this film, like, a hole in the floor where you go through and you can get to this, like, hidden basement thing. And... I just like those types of things because those really, especially like the hidden areas, adds to what's strong with Giallo films, which is kind of the the um, sleuthing and exploration part of trying to solve the mystery of who the gloved mask or gloved or trench coated killer typically is, and so I like that about it. So he starts it off really well. Uh, the chase through the waterfall and the caves, like I said, really cool, very uh, aesthetically pleasing. The head being rolled into the stream after that first person gets killed was pretty unexpected. I did not see that coming. And it was just like, you see that, like, the bloody hand, like, arm kind of, like, laying off one of the rocks. And then all of a sudden the head just flies into the stream. And you're just like, oh, oh, okay. But it, th the whole purpose of that is to kind of um, drive home the savagery of what just happened. It's not just a murder, it's like overkill. It's like extreme rage, like taking it to that next level and either ripping or cutting someone's head off and throwing it into a river. It's weird. Um, there's some strong foreshadowing uh, in the in the beginning, like after that kill happens, the killer like stabbed uh, the girl with scissors. And I think her name was Rita. And then... Um, and then it cuts over to Donald Pleasance with his monkey. I forget the monkey's name. And the monkey's, like, using scissors to, like, try and cut things. And he's like, oh, no, no, no. And he takes it away. And he's like, that's too dangerous. Don't ever play with, you know, sharp objects, basically. So that's the foreshadowing that the monkey shows up in the end, obviously. And with the straight razor, kills Frau Bruckner, I think is her name, who was one of the killers, basically. And, um, yeah, there's just a foreshadowing there. And I kind of like, this is the first time I've seen the film, and I picked up on that immediately. I was like, this monkey, I, at that point I thought, you know, maybe the monkey is the killer, but there was definitely something with the monkey and sharp objects. So that came into play later. Uh, so there's a narration that comes into this, like, and it only happens once in the film. Like, when Jennifer, which I think it's weird that Jennifer Connelly's character's name is Jennifer in the film, so... That was just weird. But when Jennifer finally makes it to the school that she's going to in Switzerland, um, there's this weird narration, like, voiceover that comes in and says something about, like, you know, I forget exactly what it was, but it was something just like, oh, you know, she was going to have a traumatic time, basically. But it was like a few, like a, a sentence or two. There was no narration prior to that. There was no narration after it. And it's just weird. Like, it, it makes no sense. It didn't add a single thing. It was 
it was just weird. I was like, why? Like, why are we adding this one little bit of narration in here when it wasn't there before, we didn't start with narration, and you didn't do it at all afterwards? Just cut it out. Like, we don't need that. This is a weird choice. Uh, when Jennifer and Sophie are talking, their conversation actually is very disjointed. That's the scene where they first meet in their room in the school, which that room that for like a dormitory type room looks super nice, especially for the eighties. Um, so when, but when they're talking, like it feels like a very disjointed conversation, although I'm not sure that that's necessarily a big problem because as younger kids, like they're teenagers, I feel like some conversations just kind of end up that way. Like they just jump topics, you know? So it felt weird, but at the same time, when I thought about it, I was just like, well, I mean, it kind of makes sense. Uh, the knife through the back of the head and out the mouth, that scene where uh, Jennifer is sleepwalking and that person gets killed and, she, like, her head flies through the window. Yeah, and then the knife goes in the back of her head and, like, out the front. That was a cool scene. I did not see that coming. That was surprising, and they pulled it off really well. It looked good. Uh, that's some intense sleepwalking I wrote down. Like, her sleepwalking was crazy intense. She could not be woken up. Uh, I actually, when I was much younger, had sleepwalking issues from time to time. And there was actually, there were times where, like, I'd get up and then I'd go downstairs and turn the TV on and be sitting there in front of the TV. And my parents would find me, like, still asleep sitting in front of the TV. Uh, or one time when it almost became a real big problem, uh, they caught me trying to unlock the door and leave the house. So I almost had a Jennifer situation from Phenomena. Because it's crazy. Like, she doesn't wake up and she's, like, falling. She almost gets hit by a car. And she's rolling down the hill. It's nuts. And then the monkey comes and saves her, which is, you know, cool. So the little bit of a concept that they throw in here, that Argento throws in, of the Swiss Transylvania thing is kind of interesting. He kind of explains it in, in more of, like, a mystical way. It's more of, like, nobody really knows why, you know, the winds make people a little bit crazy or something like that. It's... It's weird, but it's kind of interesting at the same time. But also, I don't think it should have been in this film. I felt like this is one of those portions I was talking about where it feels like it's its own film idea that doesn't mix with the Giallo part of this. Like, the Giallo part's one, and this whole Swiss Transylvania slash Jennifer's uh, telepathy with insects, that's a whole other thing. And those are the two films that they were just like, let's just put these together. And I don't think it works. It makes it weird. It makes it feel disjointed and just weird. Just weird. Uh, the classroom scene, uh, the earliest cl classroom scene where that girl's wearing like the BG shirt. And they're all talking about like, they're trying to talk about history. But it makes a really interesting point about youth being so consumed by pop culture at that time that they have literally no interest in learning about the past or learning about history, which is actually something that kind of persists to today. Like we, we as a people, and it's not just the youth of now, we as people are so wrapped up in what's current and what's going on right now because the way media covers things, they cover a lot. So you get just like a dump plus the what's available on the internet. Like, you just have so much current information that you're not even thinking about the past a lot of the time. And it's a shame because you can learn from mistakes from the past so we don't make those in the future. And it kind of just seems like it's a thing that's kind of dying out where people aren't that interested in knowing what happened in the past and are just in the present and looking ahead. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that's kind of the, one of the points they're trying to make in that scene. You know, it's a quick scene, but... You know, that's just what I thought I picked up from it. Uh, working with all the live insects and the monkey in this film must have been extremely challenging. I cannot even imagine. Because there were many situations where I assume they were tr they obviously were trying to get the monkey to do something specific. Which, that wouldn't have been as hard because I know there was a handler for that monkey. And they're intelligent. So, like, you, you can train them. You can get them to do things. So, it's a little easier to work with them. But the insects... Like, trying to get insects to do specific things, they're not intelligent. So, I cannot imagine how many takes they must have had to go through to get exactly what they were looking for. That would try my patience. I would not want to do that. That that seems rough. Uh, I think it's stupid <laughs> that um, Jennifer, Jennifer at one point is following a fly to try and solve murders. Literally. Like, the whole thing where Donald Pleasance is like, oh, these might... The, the two unknown detectives, 
you and the great sarcophagus which is also just like a weirdly grandiose name for a fly or a type of fly in this case and then it's just weird and then she's just he's just like take this fly and let it go and it will lead you to a dead body and then you will solve the mystery and you're just like why are we going this direction why it's dumb it is idiotic in my opinion just doesn't work does not work uh like i kind of said the sleuthing portions are the best portions of this film that's getting to the actual like giallo portion of it uh like i said you know it's two movies smashed together if they would have just isolated the actual giallo portions of it and expanded upon that left out all this other stuff um i think it could have been a much better film in my opinion the monkey getting on the killer's car after they killed uh, Donald Pleasance's character was over the top and ridiculous. Uh, I did like the portion where after he, Donald Pleasance got killed, the monkey was, you know, on him and obviously extremely sad. That was an impactful moment and it worked really well. But then you follow it up with, now the monkey's raging out and jumped on the killer's car and is like trying to bash the window and stuff. It was for no reason. And it's just like, I don't know, it was just, it was dumb. It was another one of those moments in the film that was just dumb. And it goes back to something that I see with Argento. Like, Argento loves to work with animals and insects in his films. If you look, if you watch, most of his films have animals or insects used in some capacity. He's got this weird fascination with doing that, which I don't understand specifically for what I just talked about, which is it must be very challenging to work with those things. But I don't know. It's his thing. Uh, the bathroom scene where Jennifer is uh, drinking a lot of water and trying to make herself throw up is excessively long. That is one of those scenes that I was saying I think should be cut down excessively long. And there are a few scenes kind of like that where it's just like, okay, there's nothing else happening here. We get the point. Let's, let's move on. It was a different time, though. Slower films were more accepted. Uh, I like how he, the term he is constantly used when everyone refers to the killer to kind of make you get into that pathway of thinking of like, oh, it's obviously a male killer when it ends up being a woman, but also kind of her son, you know, so it's kind of like both of them. So I just kind of like that, that like little um, subconscious cue that they give the audience to be like, well, let's just think about it. it's a guy and it's a single guy who's killing people. So it's kind of like a misdirection, which works. Argento uses hidden areas. I already talked about that. His hidden areas thing. Love, love, love that stuff. And there, there were some in this. Uh, the dead body pit, man, in at the end of this film is, I wrote down it's gnarly. It is, I didn't see that coming. When she just gets like, when she just falls into that dead body pit, it is nasty. And I was like, oh man. And they do a really good job. Argento does an awesome job of showing it up close a lot. So you're seeing like maggots in it. It looks like really, really gross. You're seeing the bones in it and everything and the viscera. And it just looks just disgusting. So that they're focusing enough like uh, close-up shots on it that you get an idea of how gross it really is. So when you have the further away shots and you see, you know, Jennifer uh, struggling in it, you, you kind of, it has more impact because you're just like, yeah, that's really, really gross. And I would freak out too. Uh, so what's the deal with the kid in this? He's a killer just because he has facial abnormalities. Like, I don't get it. Is it because he has facial abnormalities and he's an outcast, so that just makes him angry and a killer? Or is it because his mom's kind of kept him um, chained up? Because that's kind of the insinuation from the very beginning. Like, when you see the chains bolted in the wall and they get broken, broken and then the first girl gets murdered. I mean, it's the kid at that point, I believe, and it insinuates then that he was chained to a wall, that his mom had done that. So is that the reason why? Because she's like basically treating him like an animal, animal because he looks like an animal. Like he's caged up basically, so then he kind of becomes feral. Which, by the way, it makes me think of the film uh, Castle Freak, which actually came out after, I think that's from 1995 actually. So it is well after um, Phenomena. I don't know if there was any you know, inspiration drawn from Phenomena for Castle Freak, but I see ties. The swarm of flies killing on the kid. Another one of those stupid moments of the film. Like, just seeing the swarm of flies start 
against the moon, I was just like, oh my gosh, here we go. It's dumb. It's idiotic. This whole insect telepathy thing. I know Argento obviously liked it because he wanted to make a sequel to this, but it's just you, buddy. Well, not just you, but <laughs> I'm sure there are people out there who really liked it, and you can comment down there and let me know, but I particularly hated it. It irked the hell out of me. Yeah, I just thought it was dumb. Uh, the head getting whipped off, That I think his name was Morris, like her driver, or whoever that guy was, or her father's right hand man, I don't know. He showed up and they're like, oh, she saved, and all of a sudden, whoop, there goes his head. Didn't see that coming. That was a fun surprise. I was like, oh, whoa, okay. And then the fact that, then you turn around and she's like, oh, uh, Frau Bruckner is all like, oh, have your insects uh, save you, have your insects save you. Did she see that? I don't think she saw that. When, like, the insects came down and killed her son, I don't think she saw that. So, I don't know. It doesn't It doesn't seem to jive with the actual story and what, what was before it that she would actually know that. Plus, in real life, that's a weird thing for someone to make an assumption about or think that it's actually a real thing. That people can have telepathy with insects. So, it, it's just weird. But anyway, the point is, then the monkey comes out and starts slashing her with a straight razor and uh that's another surprise right on the heels of the surprise of the dude having his head whipped off so it was like okay that's a crazy ending so i mean i appreciated the ending for that reason um all right so some kind of wrapping up things the acting's kind of rough in this the line delivery seems like kind of labored there's a lot of it doesn't move at a normal conversational pace like people would actually deliver these lines of dialogue it moves a lot slower and so it feels kind of labored so the acting is not not so hot in this uh donald pleasance is probably the best part of it acting wise um the pacing is pretty slow in this like i talked about that you have a bunch of these scenes that kind of seem a little too drawn out should really have been cut down more you know uh jennifer's insect connection is just too much for this movie I can't say it enough. It's too much for the movie. It's this weird kind of left turn thing that you don't need for the film because what's at the heart of this? What are we really trying to get out of this film? We're trying to figure out who the killer is because that's the conflict. Murders. There's someone out there murdering people. Okay, let's solve that. All this stuff with the insect telepathy, it, it's just a left turn into like nowheresville. And it's dumb. The way it's integrated is is not good. It's terrible, to be honest. It, it's laughable. And I don't like it. Uh, but obviously the film looks really good because it's Argento. And he always looks... He, he always looks good. His films always look good because he's got an eye. And the people he uses for his cinematographers are always e excellent. Cinematography is great. Looks great. Like I said, locations are amazing. So... I like this film just for the Argento-ness of it, but the story overall is very convoluted, not so great. So um, now that leads me to my star rating for this film. <sighs> I feel kind of conflicted on it. So part of me wants to give it a two overall, because I'm not that into it because the story's kind of crappy, but it looks really awesome. And I always like the location selections. Those are always really great. And... There are a lot of cool kind of surprises in it, especially at the end. So I'm going to upgrade it to a two and a half. I think putting it strictly in the middle makes sense to me. Um, yeah, I don't I don't feel super strongly about it being good, obviously, but I feel somewhat that it wasn't a very good movie. But you know, there's there's enough to kind of redeem it a little bit. So two and a half stars. No, excuse me, two and a half stars on that. But thanks everyone for checking out this review. Put some comments down there. If you have seen Phenomena, what are your thoughts on it? Do you love it? Do you hate it? Are you in the middle? Whatever. Also, what's your favorite Argento film in general? Like I said, might be kind of deep red for me. I really like that one. Um, hit that subscribe for me. Do me that quick favor. I really appreciate it. I am not making money doing this. I'm just spending my time taking notes while I'm watching horror movies and doing these videos. So if you could repay me by just hitting that subscribe, I'd appreciate it. You can do likes on this video, but if you're just going to do one of those things... The subscribe's the bigger one. So thanks everyone for checking this out, and until next time, keep it brutal.